may have picked up sounds of banging from very close to the site where the Titanic tourist sub is believed to be. Well, we're joined by Dr Michael Guillen, the first television correspondent to visit the Titanic wreck over 20 years ago. He filmed his experience as the submersible that he was in got stuck in the wreckage. Here's what happened. I felt a little bit of a boom, didn't you? Yeah. So, oh my gosh, look at these things. Oh my off. god, look at the size of these things. Oh my gosh, so are we stuck or what? He's trying, I guess, to back out, but we're still feeling this real scraping sound. And as you can see, the whole view is clouded by this rusting. We're out. Oh, we're out. Oh, oh, oh. oh my god. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's you. Thank god. My goodness. Yeah. Well, Dr. Michael Guillen joins us now. Very good morning to morning. you. Um, do you know what, Michael? Richard and I both listened to an interview yesterday that you did talking about your experience, but you have been so overwhelmed, haven't you? Because you know what it is like to be trapped in the way that these five poor souls are trapped in that sub. I heard you moved to tears by that. I just, you know, firstly just want to say it must be a very difficult time for you having been there. Just, just you know what it is like. Yes, uh, well, good morning, Richard and Susanna. And just even watching that video right now, it's, uh, wow, well, it's uh, <laughs> something that I will always live with. Uh, it's very emotional for me. I feel a special uh, kindred spirit with these Four souls who are down there. I, I feel so close to them, almost to the point where I feel like I'm down there again. Uh, it is very emotional for me, but um, I, uh, I I just want to say that this news about um, these sounds that they're picking up. This is what I've been saying all day yesterday. That hydro you you communicate from a submersible like that with the mothership, with the research ship through hydrophones, not uh, electromagnetic waves, radio waves don't uh, communicate well in the ocean because it's salty, it's ionic. So it's basically acoustic. It's akin to the same principle you use with two, can two tin cans connected by a string. And I was saying all day yesterday that if indeed their hydrophone failed so early in the mission, less than two hours down, which means they never even made it to the bottom. It took about two and a half hours to get down to the bottom. Uh, then the, at the very least, they could just take their cups and bang on the side of the sub. Um, that's what I would do if I were down there. And I'm sure that's what the pilot would recommend to everybody. They have five people. They could make quite a racket simply by wrapping on the inside of the sub. Sound communicates extremely well in water, much better than it does even in sound. And so I, I when I heard this news just a short while ago, it gave me great hope perhaps they're still alive because if indeed this is these sounds that they claim to have picked up are coming from the people inside wrapping on the inside of the sub they can triangulate its location then of course it's a question of then once you once you locate them depending on how deep they are how do you get them back up this sub i'm told was designed so that in case of an emergency it would float to the top uh, and that didn't happen. And that was also a big concern of mine yesterday. So I was saying, well, if there is a catastrophic failure of sound, why aren't we hearing people rapping on the side? And why didn't this thing come up? Because I can guarantee you, and you saw my pilot, Victor, he was a former MiG pilot. He's a man used to dealing with situations of life and death and uh, uh, dealing under pressure. I know that that pilot in the Titan, uh, currently missing, would have been doing everything he could to get that sub to the surface. So a little bit of uh, good news this morning. I, I, you know, I think to myself, and I was thinking all day yesterday, that these waters in the North Atlantic are treacherous. They're, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it, the, w w down below, it's very cold. The pressures are very high. I'll give you a little illustration in a moment of how, uh, how big the pressures are. And I'm just hoping and praying that the waters that claimed the lives of all those people on the Titanic more than 100 years ago and that almost claimed my life uh, won't claim the life of, of uh, this sub and its occupants. But just to give you, Richard and Susanna, an idea of, of the pressures down there, what we did before we dove is that we painted up some styrofoam cups. This is, uh, you can see it says September 
uh, mm. uh, two, 2000. And then it was September is my wedding anniversary. So I thought I'd treat my wife as says happy anniversary, sweetie. What we did is we put some of these cups on the outside of our submersible. They were put in a, one of those onion skin bags. And this is how they came back. So this is what happens when you're down there that far down, two and a half miles down, all the air is squeezed out of the styrofoam cup and this is the result. So you can imagine what it'll do to a human body. This is no joke. This is not, I know they talk, talk about it being a tourist submersible. That concerns me. That, that it's almost like too flippant. This is a very serious matter, um, uh, something that should be taken seriously and not to be joked about. This is not a Disneyland ride. Can we take, can we take you back 23 years? Um, you reached the Titanic quite safely in your, in your submersible. You were, you were yeah. going around it, viewing it. it. Must have been an extraordinary experience. And then yes. you got caught up in one of these very deep water currents and your submarine lost control, didn't have the power to fight the current, and it was forced into the huge propeller of the ship. And it was wedged there. It was jammed there. Take us... Yeah. Now, the clip that we showed was 30 seconds long. It didn't convey the horror that slowly began to overcome all of you in there and the panic as the minutes right. became 15 minutes, became half an hour, moved towards an hour, and you couldn't get yeah. the damn thing out. Tell us about what that was like for you. I think the drama for me began when we had finished our tour of the bow. Everything had gone well. We had a moment of silence in honor of the people who'd lost their lives down there. Because remember, this is not just a wreck. This is a sacred grave site. This is where people lost their lives. And just to thinking, I was there. I could see the Titanic. It was as close to me as my hand is to my face right now. And as we were departing from the bow, everything was going fantastically. You, you travel across what's called the debris field. This is where all the stuff spilled out of the Titanic when it broke in two. The bow came straight down. The stern did a somersault, landed on its back. So we were heading towards the stern. It was the second half of our journey, if you will. And what I noticed right away was how shiny the propeller was. And you're right, uh, Richard, that propeller is huge compared to the size of our little sub. And I was just captivated by it. I was like, wow, it's so shiny, because it's got brass in it and doesn't tarnish that much down there. The rest of the Titanic is gray and decaying. And then I sensed that we were speeding up. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd. We should be slowing down. We're approaching the propeller. Sure. And we later found out that indeed, as you indicated, there are very strong uh, underwater currents, strange as it may sound, yes, very strong underwater currents. And it was just our bad luck that our sub got caught in that and it was jammed us right into the uh, blades of the propeller, got caught behind the blades. And this is what you're seeing on, on the video there. Um, my initial sense was I didn't want anybody in the sub to panic. We had been warned ahead of time that when people are in that situation, they panic, they go for the hatch, they want to open up the hatch thinking they're going to escape, but in fact, they hasten their own demise. So my, my worry is that I'm hoping nobody else in the sub would panic, and I was ready to gang tackle anybody who would do that. Mm -hmm. Then my scientific brain kicked in, and I started thinking, well, this is a problem, right? We have a problem, Houston, and, uh, but there must be a solution. I'm a professional problem solver. And so I started ticking off all the various ways in which I could imagine we could be rescued. But it was pretty quick um, that I realized uh, I, hit, I hit a brick wall, really, and couldn't think of a way, any viable way or any realistic way that we could, re, we, we could be rescued. And I think that's when a kind of resignation set in. And, and that's when the, that voice in my head, and I'll never, ever forget those words that came into my head, this is how it's going to end for you. And I thought it ironic because I'd been to the North Pole, the South Pole. I'd covered the Persian Gulf War, almost was killed with bullets flying all over the place. But I thought, this is it. This is how it's going to end. And then what flashed through my mind, and I'll never forget it, is I thought, my gosh, I'm going to, I'm going to join all the souls who lost their lives down here. I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to lay and rest. I mean, the rest of the, for eternity, my, my body is going to be down here with the rest of them who went down with the Titanic. And then I, I had a sense of peace, and that I can't explain. And then the sub went quiet. Uh, the, up until then, the, the engine was straining. Victor, our pilot, who was a former MiG pilot, as I said, was trying to rock us out of there, get us somehow dislodged from this giant thing that had 
kind of trapped us in there. And uh, after it got quiet, there was a sense of floating. And I, I know my diving buddy and I kind of exchanged glances as of what, what happened? Well, one possibility is the engine just died from overexertion. And then we thought, well, we're really dead in the water now, literally. And, and then um, I, I dare, we hadn't talked to our pilot very much. We didn't want to distract him. He was focused on trying to get us out of there. He was our only hope. And so we didn't want to mess things up by, by distracting him with our yakking. But I, because there was this inflection in our journey with this quiet and the floating sensation that we suddenly had, I dared to say just one word to him. I looked at him and I said, okay. And then he turned to me, as you saw in that video, and the, the thick Russian accent, I'll never forget. He said, no problem. And then uh, the sense of relief was just, oh, my goodness. I, it was like winning the lottery. It was beyond winning the lottery. It's unbelievable. Wow. Dr. Michael Gillen, honestly, it's, a, it's such a privilege to talk to you, and, and what an enormous relief. We just hope that same relief will come to, to the people on, on the sub. Because, you, you know, listening to you throughout the interview, it's, it's obviously had a massive, a massive impact on you, what's happening. Um, stay with us. We, we're going to talk to our uh, newspaper reporters here, Andrew and Kevin. I mean, just, just listening to somebody who's think? been there. Oh. I mean, oh, I, it, it, I think I, there I, are I, lots I felt, of people... I was there with him. Didn't you just? Yeah. I almost feel the sense of panic rising. Yeah. But you know what? Also, I, one of the things that struck me when he talked about um, in an emergency, your survival instinct yeah. kicks in, right? Yeah. So your automatic response is, mm. get me out of That's here. That's right. So you would go to the hatch. So Michael said he was on standby to, to rugby tackle anybody yeah, yeah. who decided to do yeah. that. Make sense then yeah. why these guys are bolted in from Absolutely the outside. Absolutely right. Because if you open the hatch that deep down... That's it. It's you, all you'll over. be crushed to death. Yeah, but it, but it was just listening, listening there, and it was it was incredibly engaging and compelling, and, and also terrifying. Absolutely, because there are five people in what it's a van. A, it's a yeah. yeah, it's the size of a van. You're trapped. You're trapped in, and you just you don't know, and you will go through all those uh, emotions, and it is that. Uh, you know, and you can't talk too much down there. You can't no, you because you don't want to use up the oxygen. Up the oxygen. Yeah, that's, and that's going to be, and you, you've got a 19-year-old boy in there. And can everybody stay calm, or yeah. would you panic? I, I think if it was me, I'd probably be panicking. And he uh, was, uh, and he was in that position for just over 60 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. These guys have been in this position since Sunday. Yeah. Um, so God knows Three what's days. going on down there. Yeah. yeah. Three days. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and the, yeah, the, look, the, lo the longer this goes on, the worse it is. I know the, the, the if the tapping, the noise is them, you've yeah. still got to get to them. And this is a race against time because the oxygen is running though, out. Banging with your... Because as your, one of your guests yesterday said, banging with your cup on the inside of the submersible can be picked up on a plane flying... And there has been. And it's been picked up. And it, we just hope that that is if, if that's, them but, but, and that they can find it. But then they've still got to find the way to winch it to the surface, the to but they can't do it too and, quickly. And, 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 and then they've got to open it. And, and that is where I think there was more, more hope yesterday when we talked... 24 hours earlier, we, sp we spoke about this mm. because there was, there was more oxygen but, then. But reading into it, why did it take eight hours to alert the Coast Guard? Mm. I want to just... I don't know if Michael Guillen is still with us. Yes, he's not. Um, I just want you to listen, uh, Michael Guillen. You've probably heard this already, but this is a podcast from the end of last year when a CBS journalist, mm. David Pogue, okay. interviewed... Um, Stockton Rush, who uh, owns uh, or runs Ocean Gate, which is the company that runs this sub and is on the sub as well. Just listen to what um, Mr Rush told CBS journalist David Pogue last November. There's a limit. You know, at some point, safety just is pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed, don't get in your car, don't do anything. At some point, you're going to take some risk, and it really is a risk-reward question. I said, I think I can do this just as safely by breaking the rules. Does that strike you as a, as a cavalier attitude, considering the extraordinary dangers of going down to Titanic? Yes. In a word, yes. Um, sounds very irresponsible to me. Look, I, I know there are thrill-seekers out there. I went down there because I was a correspondent, and I was given the opportunity to be the first TV correspondent to go down there. So I, I couldn't really turn it down, even though I have a deathly fear of water I have all my life. I thought this was my job. 
But uh, to hear that gentleman, and especially the gentleman who's in charge of this, to be speaking like that. And this is what was also concerning me, uh, Richard and Susanna, uh, all day yesterday. Uh, there was a kind of a jocularity, a kind of lightheartedness, a flippancy about all of this. Well, you know what? Um, I, I have been covering science beat. I've been all over the world. I've covered volcanoes, uh, mudslides, you name it. I often say that I've had a disastrous career because disasters are my beat. And I, I almost bought the farm, um, not because I was reckless or any of the people in, involved were reckless, quite the contrary. These were very serious-minded people. The vessel I was in was specifically designed to be a scientific uh, a research vessel, unlike this one, which is designed specifically for tourism. And I even... I don't like the word tourism because it, it, it connotes something that is, I don't know, uh, more on the entertainment side. Mm. But when you're in the ocean, one of the things I did the night before I dove, because I wanted to see what the people who lost their lives in the Titanic, the last things they saw uh, before they went down, I wanted to be, so I went up to the captain's deck all by myself. It was already very late at night. And I just leaned up against the rail and looked out over the North Atlantic Ocean. And two things came to, my, came, came to me that I'll never forget. Number one, the restlessness of the ocean. It just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like this monster that's just ready to gobble you up if you're at all careless. For one second, it'll just swallow you up and, it'll, and you will never be seen again. And of course, this is what happened to those poor people. And then the second impression that I had that will stick with me all my life is that when I looked around, I did a, a 360 degree, I just turned around in the deck and there was 360 degrees of nothing. This is what the people saw when they went down with the Titanic. There was no hope. There was nobody there that they could turn to or reach out to. There is nothing out there in the North Atlantic. We so to hear somebody like that who's in charge of the lives of five people speak so, I'm sorry, but... No, Mr. Gilliam, I, I, no, we, 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 expected you, we expected you to have that reaction. We're almost out of time. Can I ask you just very briefly, you said something fascinating to me in your earlier testimony, that at a point when you really thought that was it, you had a sudden sense of peace and acceptance. And I took from that a kind of cold comfort for those five guys who had down at the Titanic as we speak, because if they're, if they're not rescued, and that's a real possibility, if they're not rescued, do you think they'll, they'll find that kind of, of, of final acceptance? I wonder, Richard, I can't venture to say yes or no. It was just my experience. Um, it's just something that is beyond describing in words. It, I did, I've done my best to try to help people understand what these poor souls might be experiencing right now. For me, it was an uncanny, I would even so, so go so far, although I'm a scientist, so I have to be careful the words I use, I'm also a reporter, but it was a piece that I don't even completely understand myself to this day, but it was a piece, period. Thank you so much for telling your story. We, we really appreciate it. It's a real insight uh, into what may be going on down there as we speak. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael Guillen. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I, I read, was down deep in that ocean. It's like being in space, apparently. Mm. It's so dark, it's so yeah. deep, it's icy. And cold. And cold, and the currents are so powerful. You think it's some homogenising that doesn't move. It's, yeah. it's, it's lethal. At 7 o'clock, uh, we will get the very latest from our correspondent, Noel Phillips, on what that aircraft picked up, mm. those, those noises. And, obviously, we just... You know, we just hold out hope. We That's do. all you can do. We hold out hope and, and our thoughts with the families I as well. I keep thinking about that 19-year-old boy. I know. Mm. Well, it's hope for the best, but you yeah. fear the worst. We fear for the worst, yeah. We do.